merchandise. We just celebrated May Day. And take to the stars to look up and uh, find out what's in the maps and what's in store for uh, this next month and get to know Rick and Jeff a little bit better. L please, let's welcome the boys back. Da boys. But uh, we also want to wish you a happy birthday, Clint. It was your birthday. Happy birthday to you. Clint. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Clint. Happy birthday to you. Yay, our wonderful host. And for any of you who are newcomers, Clint is um, a co-owner of, um, of Soul Food Bookstore. And, and he lives in the alley in the back, so you can, you can, you know, connect with him anytime you want. And before we get started, we'd like to actually thank Soul Food Bookstore for hosting this every month in Redmond. Soul Food, as you may know, is a wonderful community asset, and you can support it by buying an extra cup of coffee tonight or buying the things that you might buy somewhere else here, gifts, whatever. Uh, patronize Soul Food. Jeff and I show up as a you know volunteer effort for the community, and so you can patronize Soul Food to support them supporting us. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, thank you for coming out. Uh, for those of you who are new to our astrology nights. How many first timers do we have here tonight? All right, thank Three, you for coming. Ten. So uh, what we're going to do, Rick and I are going to talk for roughly 40 minutes or so about the collective astrological patterns for the month of May. This we call the cosmic weather. It's not about your individual chart. It's about our collective experience. And as with all of life, we live in our own unique bubble of experience and our lives overlap and we share larger pools of reality together. And that's what we'll be talking about for most of the evening. Then we're gonna take a break. And then after the break, Rick and I are gonna look at the individual charts of three people. If you would like to be considered uh, for the drawing, please put your first name, your time, date, and place of birth on a piece of paper. Or uh, a $20 bill, we understand. Wh works. Whatever you like. Uh, and fold it up, put it here behind our uh, wonderful videographer, Julie, and we will, during the break, uh, draw three names, and then after the break, we will look at three charts. Well, here we are again. How long have we been doing this? Uh, we've been doing it for about three years, but it's always like the first time, and... Tonight, uh, we're going to talk about what's going on this month astrologically in the merry month of May, which is largely characterized, uh, at least at the first two-thirds, by the sun in Taurus. Uh, yes, and I think that this year, the sun in Taurus for the first two-thirds of the month is a bit misleading because there is some real movement toward the end of the month and, um, and, and, and I think that when the sun moves into Taurus, every year we experience the density of the zodiac. And when I say dense here, I don't mean anything to do with the judgment of someone's intellect. I mean dense as matter is condensed into, into having substance. And Taurus is the time of year when the idea and the creation that happens in Aries gains substance. Right, this is the second sign of the zodiac. And in the cycles of the 12 signs, Aries is a spark of life. It's the initiating point, but Taurus is the body of life. It's the embodiment of that initial inspiration or, or that spark. And Rick is quite right in, in, in talking about the idea that in Taurus, we generally want stability. Yet, there are a variety of reasons why that might be a little bit harder to come by this month. Now, one thing we have going for us is that Mars, the planet of action, which is in Virgo, an Earth sign like Taurus, like Taurus, and therefore compatible with the Taurus sun in principle, that is, Earth signs are oriented towards productivity, not, con not conceptualizing things or feeling things, but actually being productive. So Mars, the warrior planet, had been retrograde up until the middle of April, up until the middle of last month, 
It's now picking up speed, moving forward, which gives us the sense of starting to get traction. However, or add, every sign of the zodiac is associated with at least one planet. It's called its ruling planet, and that planet tells us something about the sign. And Venus, which is Taurus's Kia ruling planet, ain't exactly into stability this month. Well, that is true, and oddly enough, she's slowing down, although that's not very stable. And let me explain. You know, when planets are, are close to Earth, they look like they move backwards. We all know about Mercury retrograde because Mercury turns retrograde three times a year as Mercury comes between the Earth and the Sun, just like a train on the track next to you getting closer and closer. When the tracks get so close, you look out the window. If you're going faster, it looks like the train next to you is going backwards, but it's not. It's just going forward less slowly than you are. Venus turns retrograde like Mercury, but it only does it every other year, or almost every other year, um, unlike Mercury, which does it three times a year. So it's, much, uh, it's a much rarer event. Venus right now is moved, Venus moved into, into um, uh, Gemini the beginning of April, uh, about a month ago. On April 3rd, Venus moved into Gemini. Normally, Venus spends about a month or a month or so, but about a month in each sign. However, because Venus is approaching its closeness, it, 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 its uh, closest distance to Earth, Venus is slowing down, and Venus turns retrograde um, on the 15th of May. And then it stays looking like it's moving backwards, all the way through the end of June, through June 27th, and yet it doesn't really get out of Gemini until August. So we have here Venus, Taurus's key or ruling planet, in Gemini, and Gemini is an air sign. Gemini is unstable. Gemini is, is, is flirtatious, and Venus is, is, feels a little bit out of sorts, being stuck in Gemini for so long, I think. Yeah, and we should be used to that because Mars, which usually zips through a sign in seven weeks, is spending over seven and a half months in Virgo. It's almost like a relay race, and Mars has passed off its backward motion now to Venus. That's right. Venus is the planet of love, attraction, approval, self-worth, beauty, pleasure, magnetism. And Gemini is a sign of diversity. Gemini is a sign of flexibility and change. So what that means is even though the sun representing conscious will or the central force of the psyche and of the solar system is in fat, dumb, and happy Taurus, its agent, Venus, is kind of flirtatious and looking around for options. And as she turns retrograde, she may change her mind about options or opportunities in relationships, in jobs, in beauty, in clothes. So what's kind of interesting, and I think this happens a lot, is that we have planets, particularly Mercury, Venus, and Mars, which describe a lot of our behavior, but don't describe our purpose. The sun is much more about purpose. And yet the agents of the sun, Mercury, the eyes, Venus, the touch, and Mars, the motor of motion, can be off in other signs. And we're dealing with that contrast this month that in our pursuit of stability, of material and physical and emotional comfort, which is what the sun in Taurus is reaching for consciously, we're looking for it in all these little different places. Oh, if I only go on this diet, everything will be perfect in my life. If I only study this guru, no, it's this guru, no, it's this guru over here. So we may find ourselves moving around and not settling in, oddly enough, in our pursuit of settling. Yeah, and I think this becomes the dilemma, or the paradox is a better word, of May, because there is so much of an emphasis on and off and on again through the month on the Earth signs. Taurus, obviously the sun, for two-thirds of the month being in Taurus. Jupiter is in Taurus. Mercury moves into Taurus on... Do, 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 do. On May 8th, Mercury enters Taurus, so that makes then three planets in Taurus. 
Mars, which has been in Virgo forever, well, actually since January, but from Mars' standpoint, it feels like forever. Mars is in Earth sign Virgo. Pluto is in Capricorn, another Earth sign, literally forever. Well, for, you know, how many years? 12, 13 years? Something, something like, like that. that. Yeah. Um, and so this, this density of planets in Earth really sets up this kind of need to have stability, have feet on the ground, to be able to take root. And yet, meanwhile, our desires are not about taking root. Where we want to be is, is reading the next book or seeing the next movie or visiting with the next friend or eating the next meal or doing something that's, that's different than whatever it is we're doing right now. Yeah, and that, that makes life colorful, interesting, interesting. Yeah, and complex. <laughs> So the question is what you do with the complexity. In other words, if you allow the sort of butterfly mentality of Venus in Gemini to pull you away from your core values and your core desires and goals, then I think it's not necessarily a constructive issue. I think it is just a distraction. But if in your desire to build a life that's more solid and real, you enjoy the pleasure of a break, whether it's a break of a flirtation or a distraction of some kind, and don't, let, don't allow that to be the lead or the purpose of your life, but an adjunct, but a, a, a sort of additive to your life. Living on Venus in Gemini would be trying to live on vitamins. Vitamins do a good job of supplementing a healthy diet. The healthy diet, while the sun is in Taurus, is to be real, to deal with concrete or solid values, to understand where the ground really lies. And yet again, you can take other kinds of supplemental experiences, but don't let the little part overtake the bigger part. Well said. So we're now at the beginning of this month with the sun in, in Taurus. Um, and we have still a buzz cooking, though, um, because Mercury, until the 8th of the month, is in the sign of Aries. And, and Mercury, which was retrograde last month, is now moving forward, gaining speed. Mars, which was retrograde for several months, is moving forward. Unfortunately, it's gaining speed slower than I would personally like it to. <laughs> It, you know, Mars has been retrograde now for a good couple of weeks, and yet it's barely moved a few degrees. I mean, it's been direct. For I'm a good sorry, couple it's of been weeks. it's been direct now for a couple of weeks, and yet it's still barely moving a degree every two or three or four days. It's just really kind of plodding along. And in Virgo, it's being very finicky. It's being it's wanting it's still wanting to make sure everything is right before it really starts gaining speed, which it will by the end of the month. Yeah, so um, that's another reason, again, that things tend to be perhaps moving a little bit more slowly. But as we move in, today is the second. Three days from now, we have perhaps the first sort of key or critical event of the month, and that's the full moon. Now, we have a full moon every month, so that's not in and of itself enormously dramatic. But what full moons do is they represent extremes or contrasts. As the moon of emotion and feeling in the dominant feminine principle opposes the sun, the dominant masculine principle, and we both genders have both within us, it represents a, a crisis in consciousness. And crisis, as you may know from the Chinese ideogram, means danger, opportunity. And I think that's a really good way to describe it. It's dangerous because there's tension and stress building up, and yet there's an opportunity for a breakthrough in consciousness. This particular full moon, which happens every year when the sun is in Taurus, involves the moon in Scorpio, opposite the sun in Taurus. Right, and again we come back to that dilemma of the sun in Taurus basically driving us toward our senses, towards, towards being sensible, being down to earth, being practical, being grounded, wanting things kind of in a simple manner to feel. I always think that with Taurus is, is like, if you take care of the senses, everything else will just take care of itself. 
You know, it's like it's like nice food, shelter, warmth, uh, um, something good on TV, um, a good sandwich, as Jeff sometimes says, when the going gets tough, Tauruses uh, go for a sandwich uh, or something like that. But, but the problem here is that with all of this kind of um, drive toward simple pleasure and stability, the moon is reflecting us by reflecting from perhaps the most complex, the, the most mysterious, the, the most transformative place. Scorpio, although it's a fixed sign, like Taurus, is not about holding the status quo. It's about the rigidity of change that's locked into a pattern that's greater, like a glacier moving along so slowly mm -hmm. that you can't see it move day to day, and yet it takes down the entire mountain. Yeah, so Saturday, which is the day of the full moon, we're going to face that contrast between the simplicity and the comfort of Taurus, which uh, has a lot to do with denial. Let's not look at what's missing. Let's not consider the full potential of something because if we've got the sandwich we need or the comfort that we need, that should be enough. Well, Scorpio is the psychologically the most complex sign in that it churns. It churns. Well, Rick said it's a fixed sign, which means it occupies the middle of one of the four seasons of the year. The scorpionic fixation is on a process of transformation. Yeah, right. It's like, you know, Woody Allen going for psychotherapy five days a week for 35 years. That's a good moon in Scorpio situation of consistently showing up for something, but something that's kind of a probe something that's not meant to support the status quo, but something that's meant to push us beyond the bounds of Torian simplicity and comfort to get at deeper fears and at deeper desires. And, and I think that this moon, this full moon on Saturday, um, gives us some tools to get at those deeper desires because we have Mercury in Aries, exactly opposite Saturn in Libra, Aries, like Taurus can be simplistic for different reasons. Its simplicity is that it doesn't know anything other than itself. Um, Aries is the first impulse. It's the I, me, mine, fingers and toes of the baby. You know, there's nothing outside of my own world when everything is in Aries. And yet the Mercury, the intellect, the communicator planet is forming a mirror tug of war opposite with Saturn, Saturn in Libra, the sign of everyone else, the sign of the environment, the sign of the other person. And so that is, I, I no longer can exist in my simplistic world without weighing it and judging it or being weighed and judged by reality out there. And I think that gives us a tool with which we can use our intellect to get into the complexity of this Buddha birth uh, full moon. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. Look at these thick red lines here. Those are oppositions. And oppositions, like the full moon, are angles of awareness. But it's the awareness that comes from dealing with the contrast of opposing principles. And I think, Rick, you're right. There is on the positive side, and we can use or abuse any of the energy that comes our way. And the useful uh, application of intellectual Mercury and Aries opposite Saturn is to develop a greater degree of objectivity. That sort of I mean mindness perception of Mercury and Aries is, as Rick said, balanced by the hard cold reality of Saturn, the planet of hard cold reality and the sign of the other Libra. So the positive side of this is, oh my gosh, I can be going through emotional turmoil, full moon in Scorpio. I can be going through uh, financial, erotic, emotional fear and extremism. Do I hold on to what I have or do I risk it all for the next thing, for the better thing, for the deeper thing? And what this Mercury-Saturn opposition represents is the potential to have intelligent conversations, dialogue that are external with others or at least within ourselves to further develop the, the, the range of feeling and needs that are at play here. However, Scorpio's threatening. It, Scorpio is threatening. It comes in the Northern Hemisphere at that time of the year. It says, you like leaves? Forget it. They're gone. <laughs> you, like, you like plants and flowers blooming? Forget it. 
you're going to have to make it through the long, dark, cold winter and you maybe. Like fresh food? Right. Forget, forget it. it. That's right. Maybe, maybe if you're lucky, the spring will return, but you can never be sure. I mean, that's a good, healthy, scorpionic cynicism. Anything that can die will die. And if you're lucky, it won't be too slow and painful. You'll get there at least quickly. And yet... <laughs> Taurus doesn't like to let go of anything. As the late astrologer Jim Lewis once said, Taurus doesn't even want to let go of what it doesn't need anymore. So the question is here with the Saturn-Mercury opposition. Are you willing to have the hard conversations with yourself or those who matter in your life? If you are, and if you can tolerate the possibility that there is more than one way to see things. If you don't try to reduce things to a singular point of view, but you broaden the spectrum of perception, then you can remember with the sun in Taurus what to hold on to and stay comfortable with and to validate with, within yourself and where to exchange the job, the partner, the attitude, the behavior that's not fulfilling for something that will be. But if the dialogue is refused, if we fall back into simplistic defensiveness and go into denial, then all we can do with this is create intellectual barriers for why change is not going to happen. So it's always the case in astrology that what we can do is tell you which way the wind is blowing, but you have to choose how you're going to set your sails. And this event, I think, is a, is a pretty important one. Yeah, I, I think it is, and I think there's another piece of this that makes it so important, and it goes back to what you were saying at the very beginning about the stability of Earth and yet the discomfort of the unstable Venus getting ready to go retrograde. And that is, and I, and I think that the word that I want to, the, the two words that I want to use here are delayed gratification. And here's why. Venus which is slowing down to turn retrograde on the 15th, is moving toward a trine with Saturn. Sta remember, it, we're, we're, we're looking at the full moon with Saturn opposing Mercury. Mercury, the intellect, Saturn, the, the reality of having to deal with the other person's perception or thoughts or whatever. Mercury is just coming off of a sextile, a harmonious, a harmonious supportive aspect between the intellect, communication, Mercury, and Venus, what we want. Now remember, Venus is emphasized all month because the sun is in Taurus. And Venus, what we want, which is scattered all over the place, is slowing down on its way to making a harmonious trine with Saturn, and it never quite reaches it. It gets oh so close, and then it backs up. But what, it goes retrograde. But what that means is that it stays, normally Venus will make an aspect with a planet like Saturn, it'll last a day or two. This holds this pattern for a couple of weeks and it's like we're so close we can taste it. It's real because Saturn's involved. The, 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 the intellect, Mercury, is engaging in the conversation. We know that we can get there, and yet then Venus starts to back away, and it's like it, there's, there's a part of us that we have to think about the long haul. We have to think about where this is ultimately going rather than just the quick Gemini, Venus, I want it now. It's like we're not going to get it right now, I don't think. Yeah, I think that's well put. Not only aren't we, aren't we going to get it right now, but do we really want to get what we're going after? Good I mean, question. Venus in Gemini can really be a half-assed effort. I really tried. I mean, I kept at it for like a minute and a half, you know, and she didn't go for it. I think a good way to look at this, if all you go to Whole Foods for is to get the free samples, then you're doing... A, a Venus in Gemini version of not engaging, not committing. I mean, it's okay to just go there for the samples if you plan to buy something that really pleases you. That's where Venus in Gemini works well. If you are sampling things in life, that's fine, but there has to be some level of maturity and commitment behind it to be willing to jump in if indeed you find the person, the situation, or the dried fruit that pleases you. But if all you're doing is tasting and sampling and wondering why you're leaving with an unfulfilled uh, need, well, that's why. 
the Buddhas talk about biting in. And Rick pointed out, this is the Buddha full moon. Buddha was supposedly born, illuminated, and died with the full moon in Scorpio. And one of the things that a full moon or that Scorpio suggests is, look, it might kill you, but if you really want to get at what's going on, you have to dive in more deeply. And, and that's one of the messages of Scorpio in general, is the, is the idea of the death involved in the merge. You know, even even the the little death, um, you know, of, of of an orgasm. There's that sense of the ego has to give it up. <coughs> excuse me, in order to um, reach the transformation. Yeah, absolutely. So a good a good idea for Scorpio and its modern ruling planet Pluto is addition by subtraction. What are you willing to give up? In other words, what this full moon can bring up is something that doesn't feel good or look good. Maybe it's about you, maybe it's about your jealousy, maybe it's about some other aspect of yourself that isn't pretty and nice. Full moons tend to dramatize things and a Scorpio full moon can dramatize some of the shadowy aspects of the self that we really don't want to look at. The point is that if you look honestly, you don't have to beat the crap out of yourself. Just an honest willingness to look at what your needs are, what your desires are, does not require you to take immediate action. The authenticity of showing up fully to feel what is hidden within you is an incredibly empowering and ultimately enriching thing, even though in the moment it might not taste all that good. So once we move past the full moon, um, I'm, I'm going to animate this in a moment, but I just want to point out two things to watch as we move this ahead by a week. One thing is here the Sun in Taurus and Jupiter in Taurus. Over the following week and a half after the full moon, the Sun will actually approach and line up, conjunct, um, focus its energy in a straight line with Jupiter, and we'll come back and say more about that in a moment but the sun will line up with Jupiter. The second thing that I want us to watch as this unfolds is this, what will become a grand trine in Earth. Earth planets, which we've talked about already, are about the senses. It's about down to Earth and being practical. And we have Mars in Virgo moving toward a trine with Pluto in Capricorn, Earth to Earth. And then we will have over the next week Mercury moving into Taurus and it coming into trining both Mars and, and uh, Pluto. And so I just want you to see how this unfolds. Here's the sun getting closer and closer day by day to Jupiter. Now on the um, 8th, um, on to the 9th, Mercury moves from Aries into Taurus. And then in the days ahead, do you see that triangle, that blue triangle that begins to thicken up? Well, what happens is that that becomes over the course of several days, and these several days are the same day that, that Venus turns um, retrograde, um, as it almost, almost, almost reaches that trine to Saturn. Can you see how thick all these blue lines are as these aspects get closer and closer and closer? And so we're left through the middle of May with this grand trine in Earth, and then Venus never quite makes it to Saturn and backs up. A couple of things about this. Rick had mentioned earlier a couple of times now that Mercury, the planet of lower mind, perception, communication, data, Mercury moves from fiery Aries into earthy Taurus on the 8th of May. And what that means is that the things you're talking about doing the things you're talking about starting require some kind of engagement. That's the earthiness of Mercury in Taurus. But I want to talk also about Jupiter. Jupiter, the largest true planet, bigger than all the other true planets put together, called guru in Sanskrit or Hindi, meaning teacher. Jupiter is a planet of expansion, growth, optimism, and opportunity. It spends about a year in a sign, and Jupiter in Taurus suggests, which ends in June, suggests in the positive sense that there is great wisdom and opportunity that has to do with bringing things down to earth in a concrete basics kind of way. And the sun's conjunction with that Jupiter and Taurus energizes it. 
it energizes this sense of being aware of what are some solid, real, grounded values for ourselves. And with all of this Earth energy, the upside of it, and I think it's part of the wisdom of Jupiter in Taurus, potentially, is the notion of what's healthy for us food-wise. You know, this may address some of the GMO issues and some of the pesticide issues and things like that. That would be, I think, an Earth-aware consciousness of uh, Jupiter in Taurus and the sun joining Jupiter. But if you're at the other end of the spectrum, on the, what day is it, the 13th, when the sun joins Jupiter in Taurus, that's the day to write your check to the Republican National Committee. Because if you are a fat cat and you want to support fat cat houses for those fat cats, that's really a good day to do with it. Because what the shadow side of Taurus is, I'm comfortable, screw you. Like, you know, there, there's a book that just came out, was written about the New York Times, had an article about it today. It was from one of Rit, Mitt Romney's uh, fellow uh, uh, partners at Bain Investment, Bain of Existence Investment, and he was talking about how inequality of wealth is really a good thing. Now, I understand that that's an argument that few are going to make in this room, but be aware, we're all fat cats somewhere. You might be a leftist radical who only consumes the bare minimum of calories that you need every day, but you may have some fixed attitudes and beliefs and a sense of comfort in your ascetic lifestyle. If you're going to be a pompous ass, great day to celebrate your pomposity <laughs> in whatever form it is. That will be on the 13th. And yet, if you're open to learning from the earth, it takes, it takes humility to learn. And although Taurus has a humble side, both the Sun and Jupiter have a dash of arrogance to them. Oh, it's arrogance and, and confidence and, and uh, is the word bombacity? Bo bombasticness, whatever the noun is. Yeah. There's this sense of, of, of grandiosity, of, you know, of, of inflationary thinking and right. action. But you know, it's interesting, Jeff, it struck me as you were talking about the Jupiter and Taurus and the Jupiter lining up with the Sun, that, that Jupiter isn't very comfortable. It normally, the Jupiter, Jupiter Sun conjunction is arguably a good conjunction. And yet in Taurus, it's an odd place for it to be because it has this hope in this expansive and this philosophical side to Jupiter that's about, it's, it's about ideas and ideals and, and hope for the future. And yet Taurus keeps bringing it back down to, yes, but have I been fed? Right, so that, that there's a paradox between the futuristic visionary qualities of expansive Jupiter and the I'm okay the way I am, I am who I am, I ain't changing qualities that we associate with the sign of Taurus. Well, yeah, and, I agree. And, and, and you know, we'll talk more about this grand trine in th this Earth grand trine in a moment, but as long as we're here talking about the um, conjunction of the Sun and, and Jupiter on the um, 13th, um, let's not forget that these two planets are actually, this green line is a quincunx, which is an odd aspect. Quincunx is Latin for five twelfths, and it's an aspect of ill adjustment, almost like, like chalk on a chalkboard or oil and water, not, not really mixing. And so what is this big idea, hopeful, um, uh, I will have my senses fulfilled, what is it mixing or not mixing with and it's not mixing with, with, the, with the limitations that we're facing with Saturn. And this quincunx, I think, is somewhat a defining factor of the whole month. It doesn't Agreed. let us settle in to the comfort of that Earth grand trine that we'll get to talk about in a moment or two. Yeah, and I, I think that can also play an important role in terms of the larger life decisions like long-term goals, career, for example, because Jupiter and Saturn the two largest physical planets have a great deal to do with strategy and where we fit into the world. Jupiter is what we aspire to and Saturn is the reality that we're dealing with. And when they're in this oil and water mix, we can be caught up into this Jupiter and Taurus of I can see all these good things for myself. Taurus can tend to be pretty selfish. And yet Saturn in Libra is how much do I share with others? How much do I have to adjust and accommodate in terms of dealing with others. So it's an, it's an interesting issue. And 
Queen conchs are chronic. They're not critical. They don't resolve themselves. Exactly. They just represent some ill-fitting pieces that we have to adjust to to deal with the contrast as best we can to make room for them rather than resolving the issue. Two things on this. No, one is I think of the quincunx as the mosquito in the tent that you can't ever find, that every time you're just ready to doze off, it, you hear that, and then it stops and you go, you know, and then you try to find it and you can't find it again. I think you're right. It's not critical. We can't deal with it. The other thing I wanted to say about this quincunx is that, yes, it can affect us in relationship to our own personal life goals, but Jupiter and Saturn together often represent the larger economic cycles. And I think here we have something, because this aspect, which is exact for the first time, the Jupiter quincunx Saturn, on May 16th occurs again because of the retrograde motions um, on, on December 22nd and then a third and final time next year on March 23rd. And I think that this is about uh, Jupiter is expansion, Saturn is contraction. Jupiter is liberal, Saturn is conservative. And I think here that we get this, um, this kind of paradox of who's playing which side of this of this economic game of spending money to save money or saving money so we have money to spend that I think we'll be hearing more and more about in the you know, political economic discussions that will be tied to the presidential elections. Yeah, absolutely. In a presidential year here in the U.S., it's politics you know, 24-7 for those who are in the game. And this certainly could talk about this is like the ill-made alliance. Yes. So where you think, all right, we sat down, we came to an agreement, you're going to support me on this position, I'll do this for you in exchange, and probably the alliance won't hold. But it doesn't mean that the negotiations were fruitless. Right. What can happen is you and I can have a negotiation, we can make a deal, the deal falls apart, but maybe as a result of those initial negotiations, later on down the line, we're going to be able to have a meeting of minds somewhere, but it probably won't be this month. So let's come back a moment and talk about this grand trine, because we've been talking about the, the Earth energies, that sense of the practicality, the, the feet on the ground that we have during all these other changes. And we have here this grand trine through the middle of the month with, with Mercury in Taurus, Mars in Virgo and Pluto in Capricorn kind of creating this this anchor that I think holds us it gives us this anger ang <laughs> cute anger because Mars is the angry red planet and although Mars can certainly get pissed off it can only hold its anger for a minute or two compared to Pluto which can hold it forever and so that is true. Um, uh, I think here that this grand trine does say something about the patterns of anger or resentment or where we've been done wrong that as Mercury moves into this, we can either make, we can either talk about, but some, somehow we don't get to the real core because it's a grand trine. It's too easy, I think. Mm -hmm. I, I, here's a, the ongoing discussion yeah. of our aspects, good or bad, or do they help facilitate and things or lock up patterns that are you know, there. Y yeah, what that means is in astrology, these trines, these angles of 120 degrees are considered to be butter. They're great. They're wonderful. They, they grease the flow of things. Yet, sometimes they connect planets that are harsh. Now, does this butter, does this easy flow between badass planets just mean that the bad guys are going to have better guns? <laughs> I don't know. What it suggests is that we're well equipped to think, act, and, and engage. Whether we do that in a constructive way or not is a question. And what Rick was suggesting is that the butter or the easy grease of the Grand Trine is such that maybe we won't try. You know, it's, 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 it's like having so much money that you don't have to try. I'm so lucky I don't have to do anything. I think the nature of the planets involved is too edgy for it to fall in, in, into that side of things. And yet what it really offers is if you want to dig in studying, researching, engaging uh, in a way that's going to produce concrete and practical results in your life, this is a, a potentially useful pattern. Yeah, and, and I think, again, I'm going to come back to, I said before, there were two words, delayed gratification. I think that what happens I here... I thought you were going to wait. 
hmm? for that. You don't. <laughs> Well, I think what happens is because the Mercury as one corner of this grand trine is in Taurus along with Jupiter and the Sun that are still, I mean, they're pretty closely conjunct, that what's happening is that with all of this energy in Taurus, we look to Venus to see how this is going to work out. Venus is in this harmonious trine with Saturn that's holding the energy, but Venus is slowly backing away from the car with her hands in the air saying, you know what? I don't think I want to play this game right now. And so there's this, there's this sense of we get close, we can deal with it, we can talk about the issues, we can engage in the discussion from, from a lower chakra, and yet I think we can still sidestep the issue or at least set in motion the stuff that then forces the resolution a little bit later. Yeah, and I think one way to work with, you know, when planets are retrograde, it doesn't mean they're bad. They're revisiting territory they'd recently been in. And it does represent an opportunity to review. It does represent an opportunity to, to look more deeply in ourselves. Now, using the word deeply and the word Gemini in the same sentence is oxymoronic, which is what a Taurus is. It's sort of a stupid ox. But, <laughs> but um, the real question here, I think, because as Rick points out, we've got this solid, reliable energy. The question is, will the meanderings back into the past, old friends, old lovers, old interests, old curiosities, will they be folded into the substance of what you're doing, or again, is it a means of escape? And that question doesn't answer itself overnight. Venus, as Rick pointed out, will be retrograde until June 27th. We're going to be tempted again and again and again to go back to that old shade of lipstick that we wore in junior high school. And does that really get us anywhere? Or is it, is it really regression or is it recuperation of something that needs to be reintegrated? And actually, that old shade of lipstick will be the one that you wore in 1965 if you were old enough to wear lipstick then. <laughs> or if you had lips then. <laughs> because... Um, behind all of this, and we're just going to mention it in passing now, next month it's going to become the topic of focus again, and that is that notice throughout this month, Uranus is moving closer and closer to a square to Pluto that it almost reached exact last spring and summer when the Arab world erupted, when the United States erupted with the Occupy everything through the summer and then on in. It was very close and on into the late summer and fall. This aspect will be exact um, toward the end of June. And so at the time that, that Venus is getting ready to go direct, this stuff will be around big time. And so I think that, and it was exact during the 1960s, and, that, and we'll talk more about that next month. But I just want to say that with all of this smooth, harmonious energy that we're working with, there's an elephant over here in the corner that hasn't been fed its peanuts yet. And it's going, <laughs> to, it's going to come back alive. Yeah. And we'll talk about it. It is the most important astrological event. For the uh, next three years. For the next three years. It's like Burning Man comes to your neighborhood <laughs> and, and is a 365-day-a-year event. So you can start getting ready for it now. So moving ahead, we um, do we want to jump to the yeah, sun? Gemini, yeah. Yeah, the sun moving into Gemini, uh, a chain of change of the astrological month, followed by um, a new moon eclipse just hours after the sun moves into Gemini. Well, here's an interesting thing. We have on the 20th of May the sun moving into Gemini, new sign, new 30-day period, and the shift from Taurus to Gemini is a shift from this is my island to, oh, there's other islands out there. How interesting. It's about being curious. It's about opening up. And a new moon, which occurs on the same day, the sun and moon joining together, is the beginning of a new monthly cycle. So we go, wait, the sun moves into a new sign. That's a new cycle. And there's a new moon. That's a new cycle. But it's a solar eclipse. And what's happening in a solar eclipse is that the moon blocks out part of the light of the sun and that pushes us back in the past. So we're getting a very sort of paradoxical message which probably no sign can handle better than Gemini. As I quote here almost every year, Walt Whitman, the Gemini, said, contradict myself, of course, I contain multitudes. That's Gemini. It's and he the, was a Gemini. 
Right. Well, I said that, but oh. it's worth well, repeating Gemini, in Gemini. He was a Gemini again. Right. He was a double Gemini. <laughs> so what we're dealing with, this is almost like a double or quadruple jointed experience. Hey, the sun's in Gemini. Hey, there's a new moon in Gemini. New, new, new. Eclipse. Who turned the lights out? Where, where are the things, where are the keys to my car that it's going to take to drive to the new experience were thrust back into the past in and a way. And Venus has just turned retrograde, which is another level of being thrust back into the past. Well, one of the meanings of a solar eclipse is that the will, which is what the sun represents, has to take a step back and integrate unintegrated emotions and feelings which is also particularly challenging for Gemini. The moon in Gemini is sort of like putting a cork in a glass of water. It'll always float to the top. In other words, airy, bubbly Gemini resists the descent into the deep mysteries of feelings that are called for here. So perhaps what at least we can do around this eclipse time is intermittently fall into like tenth of a second despair and fear. <gasps> okay, that's fun. Let's have, <laughs> can I pour you another tea? Oh shit, I'm going to die. Well, hey, I've got this really good new Earl Grey strain you might like. So if you're a little skitzy and moving in and back and forth out of time, everything is contextual. If you're feeling like you're skitzy or inconsistent and put a judgment on it that that's unhealthy, it's unhealthy. And yet, with astrological awareness and knowledge, if you go, oh, I'm developing flexibility to be in several places of mind and body and feeling in a very short period of time, I'm growing. Well, it, what, you, what you're saying is reminding me of one of my favorite lines to describe Gemini, which was uttered by one of the guys in the Fire Sign Theater many years ago. And the line is, how can you be two places at once when you're nowhere at all? <laughs> and this is what Jeff is talking about. It's that, it's that, it's, it's that being, uh, there's a British saying, uh, being too clever by half. It's like being so smart that, and, and, and you've hid the keys from the kids, that then you want to go out and you can't remember what the hell you right. did with the keys. Right. You know, it's, it, it's like being so smart and so clever and so facile and so adaptable that you forget where you are and you forget where you put things and you forget where you're going. Right. And, and I, I think that cleverness can be an issue with the eclipse. The difference is, again, to integrate something on a feeling level. The whole switch from Taurus to Gemini is a switch from containment to observation. And you know, while certainly sometimes people want us to feel, we want to feel, we want to engage, there's something useful in Gemini about flitting across the surface of things. Because Gemini is not about going deep. And that's not to say that individuals can't, Geminis can't be deep people. Of course you can. But that the lesson, the collective lesson of the experience of Gemini is sort of tasting and watching and being more of an observer than someone who is fully engaged in making things happen. And from a tactical point of view, the period of time while the sun is in Gemini is one in which it's helpful if you allow yourself to not go on a straight line to where you're trying to get to. Because if you allow the little distractions, rather than getting frustrated by them, you will broaden the experience. Hey, I was trying to get to the store and I really needed to, to get that done, but I wound up running into somebody and having a conversation. And yes, in terms of buying the things in the store, I was less efficient. But in terms of expanding learning, I may have uh, gained more than I lost. It's take the scenic route. Absolutely. You, you know, there's, there's another piece, though, that is even making what you said more true, and that is that Mercury is coming into a conjunction. Mercury is the planet of Gemini. We have the sun and the moon shifting signs together just on the day of the eclipse um, in Gemini, and then within a day, Mercury actually aligns with Jupiter. Mercury the planet, Gemini's planet, the planet of the mind, of communication, the messenger, the clever planet, the mischievous planet. Mercury lines up with Jupiter, the planet of more, the planet of, of the magnifying lens. And so again, we come back to this thing that it's really difficult 
to get the cork beneath the surface because even our thoughts, you know, we can be experiencing the death of a loved one. We can be experiencing the breakup of a relationship, the loss of a job, and I'm not wishing any of these things on anyone, but there can be all these heavy things going on, and yet the mind is Pollyanna. It's still bobbing to the surface. It's thinking about, well, there's good news here because she was in pain. There's good news in, in here because I was in pain. Whatever it is, there's, there's basically looking at the, at, the, at the uplifting side, and so it makes it even more difficult to to sink beneath the surface. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And, and with these two mental, mental planets, because Mercury's lower mind of data and perception, Jupiter's higher mind of, of meaning and synthesis, um, I think the, uh, one way to look at this is, are you coming up with a real explanation or is it a justification? Now, a justification is something that we're using to sort of let ourselves off the hook rather than to really understand what's going on. An explanation takes us a little bit deeper, and I think that's a bit of the measure of the mind around that time yeah. as to whether the ideas we're coming up are really going to be useful or whether they're just a way to skirt issues. Then, last planetary change of the month, apart from the moon, which changes signs every two to two and a half days, Mercury, the messenger planet, zips into its home sign, Gemini, on the 24th, Mercury of May, Mercury moving into its own home sign, adds greater uh, facility to the mind, adaptability to the mind, and the possibility, I think, of, of sort of putting on extra lenses. Mercury is not understanding, but Mercury in dualistic or uh, multifaceted Gemini represents the capacity of sort of having fly eyes, you know, that you can see in many different directions at the same time. Now, that may be overwhelming to some of us, but that's part of the gift of Mercury and Gemini. Yeah, it's also like, a, it's like roller skates in a way, uh, I, I, in as much as you can cover lots of distance easily without the same friction that it would normally take to get from this idea to that idea. I often think of Gemini as, as, the, old, as the AM radio dial. It's like we tune experiences. And, and we don't necessarily have a long attention span. We listen to someone talk until they sound like an idiot. We yell at them. And then we turn to, you know, to listen to news. We listen to get some drive. It, different than FM radio, where we often listen to a station and we camp out. Gemini is noisy. AM, amplitude modulation. It's noisy. It's, it's not very detailed oriented. And we're not interested in details now. We're just interested in skating from here to there to there and, and having the different experiences or getting the different data, whether or not it's useful, whether or not it's even true. It doesn't matter. It's another data point, another data point, another perspective, another piece of information. Yeah, Gemini is like a telephone. A telephone has nothing to say. And it's totally <laughs> neutral about what's said on it. You could, you could speak words of love or, or plan, plan a bombing, and it's all the same to the telephone. And that is the gift and the curse of Gemini. It's absolute, and I don't mean human Geminis, but the archetype itself is a detachment to the substance it's of the stuff. It's content agnostic. That's right. <laughs> it, it doesn't care, and we'll send it along. And so the downside is that we can get caught up in any kind of BS and yeah. and and run numbers. You know a good Gemini thing is it's like somebody who has no morals or principles and is philosophically weak but is full of data. You know, they might cite the dates in which, you know, this happened and this happened and this happened, but none of that really has to do with substance. None of that has to do with essence. And that facile quality of Gemini is both its again its gift and its curse. And I think that this year the move from Taurus to Gemini, Mercury's move from Taurus to Gemini, is even more slippery than normal because on the day before Mercury moves into Gemini, the sun makes a 90 degree stressful square with slippery, fantastic, fantasy oriented, illusory, elusive Neptune. And the day after it makes that transition into Gemini, then Mercury, the, the telephone that wants information, whether it's good or bad information, it wants information. And as Mercury makes that square to, to Neptune, instead of getting detailed information or, or facts or lies, it's getting songs. 
<laughs> it's getting it's getting dreams. It's getting it's fuzzing out. And so what's interesting is is that as even the eclipse, even the as we go into Gemini, we're we're wanting the information. We're 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 in that world, and yet there's this kind of mm, yeah, I, I, and mm. the experience of full knowledge can be the biggest illusion with these squares to illusory Neptune. It made me think about I've been I've been thinking for quite some time about people who are really religious, which I'm not and how they have had, many of them, a real experience in whatever their religious form is. All of their circuits got lit up, and that gave credibility to their picture of whatever their particular Godhead form is. And this can do it. It can open you up to the sense where you feel, I'm so plugged in, I know everything. And what I did sort of come up with over the past year or so is the realization that it doesn't take all the knowledge in the universe to blow a person's circuits. That you can be totally lit up, illuminated, see God, know Jesus, know Allah, know Buddha, know whoever subjectively is a total experience for you, but it doesn't make it a universal truth. It is a personal absolute truth subjectively, which is very compelling, and then when you have others in your circle who are reinforcing that as the truth, it's easy to buy that, and that's kind of what Neptune does. Yeah. Neptune can give us the sense that we're connected to everything, and in some ways, maybe we are, but it doesn't mean that we understand anything. So on that uh, enthusiastic note, uh, we're going to take about a 15-minute uh, break. Uh, please visit the jewelry department for the diamonds that are on sale, the rubies, the rubies, the gold. Uh, patronize home furnishings. Home. <laughs> yep. That's that's the, 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 the in the basement. So we'll take a 15-minute break and we'll uh, connect back with you here then. And remember, if you'd like to put your birth date, your first name, your birth date, time, and place on a piece of paper on the table behind where Julie is um, holding the video camera. We will draw three names and we will look at those charts. Remember, when we look at these charts, we're doing this as a teaching tool. It, it's not only about your chart, but it's about something that everyone can learn from about what's coming up in the future based upon that individual chart, kind of like astrology in action. Right, and, and your data is quasi-confidential. You have the choice of, it, of us selling it to Google or Facebook. So put a little G or a little F on your birth data and, and we'll and, send it to the right home. And one last thing before we break, and that is I'd like to remind you all that Jeff and I are going back to Bali, hopefully with some of you, uh, this October, October 8th through 18th, we'll be doing a 10-day workshop divided into two different parts. We will be starting off in the um, uh, cultural capital of Bali, Ubud, up in the rice fields. We'll be doing a workshop on the astrology of relationships. Then we will move to Chandidasa, which is on the East Coast. We'll be at a yoga retreat center there, um, overlooking the ocean. Uh, very, very beautiful. And uh, it's not as expensive as you might think it is. If you'd like to talk to either Jeff or me, either during the break or at some other time, we'd both be happy to talk to you. It's actually filling up, but there are still places available. And that's this October 8th through 18th, Bali. Join us. It'll be our fourth time there. We know it. We love it. It's a, it's a workshop retreat that, that works. It's magical and transformative. Right, and you can find a link on the front page of stariq.com, S-T-A-R-I-Q.com. Uh, that wasn't very IQ, was it? This is starloiq.com. <laughs> and also, you know, if you click, uh, what does it say? Listen. Does it say Listen or audio where we have Planet Pulse, yes. there's a button on the top of the page of stariq.com, and if you click on it, you can hear Rick and me doing about a two-minute daily forecast every day. We've been doing that for about 12 years. It's getting old. Yeah, it is getting old. <laughs> we just keep replaying the first years that we did. So thank you all for coming, and we'll see you in about 15 minutes. Um,